Last winter, I did a fair amount of work in the purification retreat on forgiveness, mostly forgiveness of myself. And so last week I did a BBC on forgiveness, and today I'd like to talk about reconciliation. It's interesting that these two topics are not explicitly talked about in the Lam Rim. However, there are some nice um, quotes from the different Nikayas about what the Buddha said about forgiveness and reconciliation. Here's two quotes. Um, These two are fools. Which two? The one who doesn't see his or her transgression as a transgression, and the one who doesn't rightfully pardon another who has confessed his or her transgression. These two are fools. These two are wise. Which two? The one who sees his or her transgression as a transgression, and the one who rightfully pardons another who has confessed his or her transgression. These two are wise. What was the name of that? Anguttara Nikaya. Then one from the Digha Nikaya. It's a cause of growth in the Dharma and Vinaya of the Noble Ones when, seeing a transgression as such, one makes amends in accordance with the Dharma and exercises restraint in the future. So I found this beautiful talk by the American monk Thanissaro Bhikkhu. And a lot of these thoughts are his. I'm just merely summarizing them and, and repeating them because they're so beautiful. And actually, they go very nicely with a lot of the study we've done uh, through the Vinaya class uh, with the slides from the Venerable um, Master Wu Yin. The Buddha succeeded in establishing a religion that has been a genuine force for peace and harmony. Those are the two. Not only because of the high value he placed on these qualities, but also because of the clear instruction he gave on how to achieve them through forgiveness and reconciliation. The Buddha taught that forgiveness is one thing and reconciliation is something else. In Pali, the language of early Buddhism, the word for forgiveness also means the earth. A mind like the earth is non-reactive and undisturbed. When we forgive someone for harming us, we decide not to retaliate or seek revenge. We don't have to like the person. We just... Uh, we simply set down the burden of holding on to our resentment and anger and let go of thoughts of revenge that keep the wheel of karma going. And this is a gift to both parties. The offender doesn't even have to, have to know or understand what we've done, or the offended, in, we, depending. <laughs> the word for reconciliation means a return to friendliness and sociability. And it requires more than forgiveness. It requires reestablishing trust. If I don't accept responsibility for my actions or hold the attitude that I didn't do anything wrong, then there's no way I can reconcile with someone I've harmed. And similarly, if I insist that your feelings don't matter and that it's unreasonable for you to hold me to your high standard of right and wrong, um, then you won't trust me not to hurt you again. So to regain someone's trust, then I have to show my respect for you and our mutual standards of what is and is not acceptable behavior in our relationship. To admit that I hurt you and that I was wrong to do so. And to promise to refrain from doing so again in the future. At the same time, you have to inspire my trust too in the respectful way you engage in the process of reconciliation. Only then can our friendship be reconciled. Some ways of attempting reconciliation are certainly more skillful than others. To encourage reconciliation among his followers, the Buddha taught detailed methods for achieving it, along with a culture of values that encourages using those methods, which we find in the monastic life. We're very fortunate that the methods are contained in the Vinaya, the Buddha's code of monastic discipline. The Vinaya instructions for how monastics should confess our offenses to one another, how we should seek reconciliation with any lay people we have harmed, um, and how we should settle disputes with each other, and even how to heal a schism in the Sangha are all, are all contained there in the Vinaya. Although these teachings are found in the monastic code, the principles can be applied to anyone seeking reconciliation of differences. So the first step in each of these cases is is acknowledging our wrongdoing. And sometimes that's the hardest part. When a monastic confesses an offense, such as having insulted another monastic, he or she 
first admits to having said the insult and then agrees that the insult really was an offense. And then eventually he or she promises to restrain themselves from repeating the offense in the future. A monastic seeking reconciliation with a layperson follows a similar pattern with another monastic monastic on friendly terms with that layperson acting as a mediator. And if a dispute has broken the Sangha into factions, then there are even detailed instructions for how to heal that split in the Sangha to restore harmony. So he makes the case that genuine reconciliation cannot be based simply on the desire for harmony because it requires mutual understanding of what actions contribute to creating disharmony. So we have a lot of discussions about that. And a promise to try to avoid these actions again in the future. And this is supported by a clear agreement about and commitment to the mutual standards of right and wrong. So for instance, our precepts, our guidelines here at the Abbey, the ways that we do things. He says that this is one of the reasons why genuine reconciliation has been so hard to achieve in the modern world. I thought that was very interesting, talking about how the global village has brought us face to face with people of deeply different standards and ideas of right and wrong. Also, in this day and age, there are so many individuals and groups that find some kind of benefit in fostering and fomenting um, the differences, differences that divide us, like race or religion, or, or can divide us, don't have to divide us. But conflicting value systems are nothing new. These, there were conflicting value systems at the time of the Buddha, and he taught a way to reconcile them. The Buddha never forced anyone to follow his way, but he did provide the opportunity for them to voluntary, voluntarily join communities of monks and nuns, together with lay supporters, and whose impact on society depended on the example that the monastics set. The proof of his middle way approach was the Sangha, who demonstrated the results of the peace and the harmony um, and the happiness that they found by following his teachings. And, um, you know, if modern Buddhist communities want to bring peace and reconciliation to the world, then obviously we have to do it through example of our own communi communal life. So twice a month, members of the Sangha all around the world meet to confess and restore any transgressions that we've made by reciting the precepts we've all agreed to adhere to. And the procedure for settling any disputes, we can put that into practice. And in this way, a sense of community is frequently reinforced by clear and detailed reminders of what ties us together as a group and make it a good one in which to live. So the procedures for handling disputes are especially important to prevent those uh, who are in the right uh, from abusing their position. The Buddha advised that we reflect on ourselves before accusing another of wrongdoing. The checklist of questions he recommended comes down to this. I think we saw some of this in the Vinaya, or this was some of the characteristics of someone who's good at handling disputes. Am I free from unreconciled offenses of my own? Am I motivated by kindness rather than vengeance? Am I really clear uh, on our mutual standards? Only if we can answer yes to these questions should we bring up an issue. I'm going to write these down and put them on a mirror <laughs> for myself. <laughs> In addition, the Buddha recommended that we speak only words that are true and kind, timely, wise, um, gentle, and to the point. And our motivation should be compassion with thoughts of welfare for all the parties involved, and the desire to see the wrongdoer rehabilitated, maybe that's too strong, or you know somehow brought back into alignment, or um, brought back into hmm, harmony within themselves. So to encourage seeing reconciliation as a winning rather than a losing proposition, the Buddha praised the honest acceptance of blame as an honorable rather than a shameful act. And not just as a means, but as the means for progress in spiritual practice. As he told his own son, Rahula, the ability to recognize one's mistakes and admit them to others is the essential factor in achieving purity in thought, word, and deed. And as he said in the Dharmapada, the people who recognize their own mistakes and change their, change their ways illumine the world like the moon when freed from a cloud. So 
In addition to providing these incentives for honestly admitting misbehavior, the Buddha also very clearly taught that we are always responsible for our conscious choices. We should always put ourselves, try to put ourselves in the other person's shoes or their place, that all beings are worthy of respect. We should regard those who point out our faults as if they were pointing out a treasure. And there is no higher purpose that excuse excuse breaking the basic precepts of ethical behavior. So I, uh, I found this to be very inspiring. The Buddha even acknowledged that all disputes can't be settled. There are times when one or both of the parties are not able to find the honesty and the restraint that true reconciliation requires. And even though forgiveness is still an option, um, Oh, and, and even though, even then, forgiveness is still an option. This is why the distinction between reconciliation and forgiveness is so important. So it encourages us not to settle for mere forgiveness when genuine healing of reconciliation is possible. And it allows us to be generous with our forgiveness, even when it's not. And as we master the skills of both forgiveness and reconciliation, we can hold to our sense of right and wrong without using it to... Um, harm others. <laughs> so, just some things to think about.